Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. And today we are looking at the most powerful diode laser we've tested in the workshop yet. And that is the Aitzer L2 36 watt laser engraver. This laser is filled with extra technology and a lot of interesting things to test out. So if that's something you're interested in hearing about, stay tuned, we're gonna jump right into it. All right, let's talk about the specs of this machine. As I mentioned, this is a 36 watt laser. They make a couple different versions of their L2 version, and this is the most powerful at the time, coming in at 34 to 36 watts. With that, it does have a stated 0 0.08 by 0 0.1 millimeter uh, focus area, so not necessarily as square as some of the smaller ones, but still uh, allegedly keeping it fairly tight. We're gonna take a look at what that means for its cutting ability in a little bit. The working area of this machine is 410 by 410 millimeters. And so still a little bit larger, some of your smaller ones, but we do lose a little bit of area compared to the P2. Added to this one is a really nice feature. We're seeing a lot of lasers and that is auto air assist. That means in light burn, you can flip that switch, it says air on for each layer and the power for the pump is going through the control board. So that can turn on and off the air pump automatically for you, which is a nice feature to have one less thing to forget to turn on. Another really big feature on this one is that instead of the V slot wheels and ex extruded aluminum kind of rails, uh, this has linear rails, linear rod. Does still have your belts and pulleys that actually pull it around, but it's actually riding on linear rails, which are gonna give it a lot more rigidity, a lot more movement without a lot of the maintenance that you get with the V slot wheels. So excited to see that. We'll see how well that performs. Along with that, we do have the intelligent Z-axis control. And this means there's a stepper motor on your Z-axis that's gonna raise and lower your laser module. And that allows it to also do auto focus, but then also you can address the Z height per layer. So you can start at the top focus and then do a second pass and bring it down X amount, uh, so on and so on, as long as you have the travel between your laser module and your material. So that can definitely help out with cutting deeper and thicker materials by moving that focus down as you make your cuts on each on each pass. It does have some safety features in it. So it comes with a flame detect, it does come with a tilt detect, and then it also has a key lockout so that you can turn that key and the machine will not be able to be turned on without that. And then another interesting feature that it tout, uh, that they say is has an Auto resume after power failure. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at that in a bit as well. Now it does have an offline controller that you can use without being hooked up the computer. There's a USB slot. You can plug in a USB drive, a little USB uh, key, and then pull your G code files off of there. Now this machine did come packed very well in a box and all the parts are with it, all the tools to assemble it. I'm not gonna go through the whole build as they do have a really good manual that will step you through this um, with some good diagrams and such. All the bags are labeled by step as far as which hardware you need to use. And there is a quick start guide on Acer's YouTube page if you do need some extra help on getting through this. That being said, if you do get this machine and you have a few questions about assembling it, go ahead and leave me a comment down below, reach out to me, I will do my best to help you with it as well. Now, before we go and throw this back on there, I just wanted to point out a few things about this laser module. So off to the side, you do have this extra piece that hangs out here. This says two things. It has your uh, red crosshair for alignment through that method, as well as on the bottom here, you have just this little touch off probe here, and that is what it uses to set its autofocus. It comes down and touches on that. But I also like the fact they have this orange shroud on here and it is all the way around. Some of the manufacturers have been going to just a small window up front, and that's really limiting if you're trying to check on your framing using the laser spot instead of the red dot. Uh, it just kind of blocks a lot of the view. Uh, as well as this one is easily removable. There's two screws, the shroud comes off, two more screws and your cone comes off for your air assist. And so it's easy to maintain, easy to get at if you're using a uh, rotary, it's really nice kind of getting this shroud out of the way. Now, as far as air assist, I mentioned it does have this nice cone down here. And so that's built in and then the air hose comes in through the top. And so that is all integrated into this unit, uh, works pretty nice. And then up front, you'll notice as I'm running through tests, there is this LED bar, which basically lights up. It's blue when the power's on, uh, but then when the laser is firing, it's red and it kind of goes from zero to full as far as the percentage power that it's firing at. So another nice visual indicator on this module itself. 
So let's take a closer look at the frame, the laser, all the parts that come with it. So as I mentioned, this is a 410 by 410 working area. However, uh, one of the dimensions that don't always get relayed is the outer dimensions. So if you're looking at building an enclosure, making sure it's gonna fit in your space. Uh, I took some measurements and kind of took into consideration that you have cables on this side that stick out a little bit. Uh, you've got this on the side too. You've got your cables up here that are gonna hoop up just a little bit, including our air assist. The tightest dimensions that this I think would fit into is about 700 millimeters wide, 770 millimeters front to back, and about 300 millimeters tall. And so if you're looking at, is this gonna fit into some of the existing enclosure or you're looking at maybe uh, building one, um, those are the bare minimum. Now taking account, that doesn't count for space for a rotary, a camera, things like that. That's just the bare minimum space for these things to move around and probably not hit anything. I was really excited to, like I mentioned earlier, does have linear rod, rail, uh, linear rods along there and on here and linear rails inside this. Um, they actually do provide this cover that the bracket kind of goes in between and that does help provide some protection from getting dust and debris inside there on the rail. Um, but you are going to want to take a look on your side ones. Be keeping an uh, eye on that for any buildup of gunk and debris and um, you're gonna need to get in there and kind of wipe them down a little bit. This cover does come off with just a few screws, so you can get in there and service it. Now, one thing I will note that when I was assembling mine, uh, I did notice there was a little bit of play in my module. Um, you do just wanna watch these rails that the, uh, the laser module mounts on. There are screws on the bottom and you can tighten those up. When I tightened those up and one was just a little loose, um, this snugged up right away. If that's really loose, you're gonna have issues when you get into those higher speeds with a lot of backlash and wobble. I also appreciate that they've run the cabling through this rail out to the side. Same with the air hose. It just kind of helps limit the type, the number of things that are moving around in there. And so really your only area where there's any cable movement is just a little bit on top, back and forth, and this over on the side with the air hose. Speaking of the air hose, this is a fairly flexible but still durable and rigid material. It's not going to kink very easily, but it will move around. And so I do appreciate that. And they do give you plenty of length for your air pump so you can get this out of the way a fair distance and still have um, plenty of movement around. Now they do provide a very nice air pump. Um, this is not tiny by any means, but not over overpowering. And um, this does then have your power supply coming out of the controller, as I mentioned earlier. So the controller does turn this on or off. So you need to make sure that in Lightburn you're using that key. It does have a variable rate so that if you want to have it on all the time, but maybe turn it down for engravings just to keep some positive airflow, you've got that feature, which is really nice. Uh, otherwise you can turn it on, put it on blast and just make sure that Lightburn is set up to um, turn your air on and off. Looking up front here, we do have our typical buttons for power. We have an alarm light. Uh, I like that they have a USB drive. This is actually like your typical thumb drive instead of the micro SD card. Um, that's for transferring files on there. And then of course, this key lockout system. You can, un you can turn the key, take the key with you, and this will not turn on. Uh, however, you turn the key, you have to leave it in there with the laser. So if it's not a feature that you're going to worry about, you wanna leave it on the, the whole time, you do have to have this key up here. I do really appreciate that they have all the cables off the side here instead of sticking up. It just gets them out of the way, it gives the machine a cleaner look, allows you to kind of plan for these on the side and not on top. I really appreciate that they've moved those out of the way. And another, it's sometimes just the little details, is that this panel, it does sit on the front of here, and it's magnetic, but it also has kind of this little notch in here, and that does key onto that front one, meaning that really grabs onto there really well. Uh, some of the other machines I've had, it's magnetic, but it can slide around and it's easily knocked off. The one thing that I feel is missing on here is I'd like a physical e-stop button. Uh, when things go wrong, you wanna be able to shut things down quickly. And even though this has a flame sensor, has a tilt sensor, things like that, sometimes you as the operator need to shut things down because the machine isn't detecting what's going on. You just need to kill power. So it'd be great to see that with this, you would probably have to hit that on off button or you know put your power supply maybe on a switched outlet or of sorts so that you can kill it quickly that way. Um, but as the machine is this in this way, doesn't have a physical e-stop button. They do provide then, of course, your USB connection to the machine. Uh, going into the machine is USB-C. Uh, they do provide a nice little cable 
that is both USB-A and USB-C. And so that is very nice. Depending on what machine you have, you're not going to have to find an adapter to be able to plug this in. And then finally, there is just a single power supply. This powers into the controller and then the power or the air pump is then powered through that. And so just one plug, one cable uh, into the wall. And this is a 24 volt, 7.5 amp for 180 watts of power coming out of this brick to power everything on here. And finally, they of course do supply the typical that you see with these lasers, a pair of safety goggles. Now these are just kind of your standard green um, safety glass glasses. There is no rating on these. They are better than nothing. So if you don't have anything, definitely wear these as they will uh, cut down on that laser light transmission. However, um, I always recommend you protect your eyes the best you can and get a pair of glasses that are truly rated for the wavelength of your laser, as well as an optical density that is going to eliminate all laser light. So for these diode style lasers, they're operating in that 455 nanometer wavelength. And typically you're gonna be looking for something that has an optical density of four or higher on that. So I use a set that I have bought and I will leave a link down below if you're interested in upgrading your glasses for better protection. That being said, these still do offer protection and I would recommend you use them if you've got nothing else. So those are a lot of the technical details about the laser, but let's see how it performs. Now, longtime viewers of the channel know that I love to test out three millimeter Baltic Burks plywood as one of my primary mediums. Now, this is a little more dense than your typical craft uh, plywood that's in that eighth inch or three millimeter range. So just keep that in mind in comparing to other ones. But I do use Lightburn and use their material tests and set up a grid. And so I did run that and made sure that we had a pretty wide scale here. So as you can see, this is our results that it was coming out. And so I ran it from 350 millimeters a minute all the way up to 800. And in this one, it just kind of squeaked out of that top one at 650. We did have just a little bit of a couple of nibs holding on that I had to push it through, um, but at 100% power, it did go through that. Now, as always, my recommendation is to back it off to where you're getting 80 to 90% power and still cutting through because material like this is inconsistent. There are glue areas that'll be thicker, or denser. You'll have little imperfections in the wood and running it at your bare minimum top speed is going to mean you're going to run into more of those areas where it doesn't cut through. So for me, I would be running this, topping it out at 600 millimeters a minute on this material. Yeah. So now three millimeter Baltic birch plywood is not necessarily typical, something you're going to find easily at your standard hardware store or big box store. So I do also like to do some tests on materials that are more common to everyone. So a lot of people have uh, some of our favorites of Lowe's and Home Depot. So I have a couple of their quarter inch-ish material. So this is quarter inch sanded plywood from Home Depot. And so I ran the same test, um, but this time I went from 300 to 600 millimeters a minute, just knowing that the thicker material really wasn't expecting it to go any higher than the eighth inch. And uh, it did pretty well at 600 millimeters a minute here with the top focus. It was cutting through fairly cleanly at 90 and 100 percent power. Then I also tried doing the two and a half millimeter offset to try to get to the middle of this because this is roughly five to five and a half millimeters thick. And as you can see, I got this weird, you know, it went up there, but there's this weird thing. Now, this is what I'm talking about. You get kind of imperfections in your material. And so what I'm seeing here is there is most likely a pocket of something right in there that is preventing this from cutting through cleanly. So anytime you're running these tests, you want to run it multiple times through the material just to ensure that your readings are getting consistent and accurate, and then you can average them out. Now, same thing for Lowe's. They have their five and a half millimeter revolution ply. I bought a sheet of that. So I've been testing that on a number of things and very similar results, but this is a little bit thicker material. I think it has some more glues in it and such. And so we topped out at 550 millimeters a minute cutting this with air assist and such on, but it was clean cuts and uh, they dropped right out. So after testing some of the thinner material in just single pass cuts, I wanted to really see how thick of a material we could realistically cut with this. Now, a lot of times laser manufacturers or other reviewers are gonna say, oh look, I cut through this material in a single pass, but they are crawling through it and they are scorching the material to where it's just ugly. It technically gets through it, but it's not really a 
true usable cut. And so I wanted to see what a usable cut would be. So for me, I tend to not go any slower than 150 millimeters a minute. I feel when you get down to that speed, you're getting just too much charring and you're getting a lot of that overburn and it's just creating more mess than it is cut. So that's where I start my ratings at. So I had some three quarter inch Aspen and started out testing this out. And so here was the first test. And as you can see here are my numbers on there. This is three quarter inch or 20 millimeter thick. And this did cut through fairly cleanly. Two passes at 150 millimeters a minute. Let's show you the back. We do have just a little bit of overburn there that would sand out fairly easy. And then our cutout, you can see there is not a lot of extra charring. It's dark, but it's not like what I would say charcoaled. So that's what I'm looking for as kind of my bare minimum. Obviously, we'd like it to be as clean as possible, but as long as it's not looking like you burnt your marshmallow at the campfire, that's where I feel it's a fairly successful cut. Now, at the 150 millimeters a minute, I kind of felt like it had almost got through in the first pass. And so I thought, let's step up the speed a little bit, because if we can do that, we can get through this cut a little bit faster. So I ran it again on another piece from the same material. And here you go, if I can get that to focus in. This was ran at 200 millimeters a minute, two passes, 100% power. Once again, it came right out. Our back has just a little bit of charring, less than the other one. That would easily sand out. And then our piece is fairly clean as well. As you can see there, hopefully, there is really not a lot of extra charring. There's some caramelization, a little bit of darkness there. But other than that, fairly clean. And I believe this just had just one. See if I can get it to focus on there. Just that little bit, little bit. It was just, I just had to just press it through and it came right out. So it's fairly impressed that this was, I wasn't adjusting the Z at all. I just set the focus um, down maybe a couple millimeters from the surface, did our two passes, ran full air, and that was the results. And so that's fairly impressive for this machine. Knowing that now we can cut circles, but what good is that? Can we do something actually fairly functional? So a decorative piece. So I was able to take a full piece of this three quarter inch Aspen and I was able to cut out the channel name. It came out cleanly. And so this again is that three quarter inch or 20 millimeter material. I have it on that kind of rail that I welded the text to on the bottom. I'll have a quick tip video on how to set up something like this and do that welding as well for you to follow. So I'll have that link down below, but really quickly here, there's the results. And so this was done, I actually just backed it off to about 185 millimeters a minute, two passes, 100% power. And this did take, what I wrote down here, just a bit over 15 minutes to finish, but you know, this was fairly clean. Uh, show you, this is the backside. So you can see there's just a few spots where there's maybe a little bit of overburn on there. Same thing on here, the, uh, <clears throat> the back side and the front side, they're fairly clean, but just a few um, spots on there where it would take just a little bit of sanding to clean it right up. And then you could stain it, paint it, leave it just natural, and you have a nice decorative piece. So of course, the feature of being able to use that step down Z axis is really nice. So I took a little more dense wood here in this and this is about a half inch material. And I set it up for about 400 millimeters a minute, 100% power, but then do four passes. And I had it drop down uh, about a millimeter per pass just to bring that um, focus point through. And as you can see, it cut through very cleanly. Here's the top side, here's the bottom side, just a little hint of that overburn. Uh, that's where getting that speed up faster reduces the amount of charring and uh, and uh, vapor that's gonna get stuck on there. And then as you can see, our cutout piece is very clean. It's just caramelized. There's really not a lot of charring. So that is where finding the balance of number of passes and a faster speed, and then tie that in with the ability to step this down per layer you know, within Lightburn uh, makes this a very um, flexible machine to really dial in some clean cut, but fast settings for being able to cut through thicker material. So the machine can cut really well, but does it lose anything in its ability to engrave? Well, you mentioned it has a 0 0.08 by 0 0.1 millimeter spot size. Now that's a little bit bigger and rectangular than some of your five and 10 watt lasers, 
but it's still a very fine point and should be able to do some quality engraving. Now they also mentioned that it can go up to 50,000 millimeters a minute in its X axis. Now I double check the settings of the laser and it is in the X set to 50,000 millimeters a minute as far as the top speed. The Y is limited to 20,000 millimeters a minute. So if you're gonna do anything vertically or if you're gonna use an offset angle like we do in some of the things to try to reduce banding, you're gonna be limited in your speed a bit from that. But those are still respectable numbers as far as your engraving speed. So I did of course run a raster test on some of our Baltic birch plywood. And I started at 10,000 millimeters a minute and I topped it out at 40,000 millimeters a minute because I honestly wasn't sure at those speeds how well it was gonna perform. But I was pleasantly surprised that it was still marking and you could get a somewhat decent marking at the 40,000. And uh, perhaps if that was the, the darkest you wanted, um, you could leave it there. But I really felt that to get a full range, because as you see, there's almost nothing in the tens for any of these, but there is just a hint of it around 15 to 20. So, so with that, I thought, well, let's, let's test a couple different ones. And so I ran a quick file. Here's uh, my workshop logo along with the Aitzer logo. So the top one, this is 15,000 millimeters a minute, 100% power. Uh, and then I do go back and add an outline. You can do that through the multi-mode, adding a second layer into, or a, a sub-layer into your layer. Uh, and so it'll follow through and do the engrave and then do an outline of everything, which just kind of helps it pop out a little bit. And so then the bottom one there again is the Acer logo at 40,000 millimeters a minute, 100% power. And so hopefully you can kind of see the variation of darkness and, uh, just a little bit of fading out on that one, uh, running at that 40,000 millimeters a minute. This job took about seven minutes, 20 seconds to complete. And so just to kind of give you an idea of its performance there. Well, I wanted to try it on a real world item. And so I did already drop this video, but as you can see, this is a 3D realistic engraving of a bald eagle with an American flag behind it. And so this is, Got a little bit of depth to it. If I can hold it right, you'll probably be able to see that there is actually some variation in depth there, but a lot of this is due to shading. And then of course we have a little variation with our grain here, but um, this is a very cool item that came out with some very good detail. So your 36 watt laser, still pretty decent for engraving. Yes, your five watts with their super fine point might be a little more detailed, but I don't think you're gonna get the speed and the color variation that you are with this one. So very impressed with its capabilities there. Now, of course, I'd like to do a little more real world testing. So I thought let's do a three dimensional object with both cutting and engraving. And so I have had this file for a while. I, unfortunately, I don't remember where I found it. So I can't necessarily share it out where I, I saw it. But, um, and of course, if you've been following this channel for a while, you know, I have a little bit of a, a, an appreciation for science fiction. And so what I did was I cut out <laughs> this cube, which may have a slight resemblance to something that some people might recognize. I am Locutus of Borg. And then uh, a cool thing here is that it actually has a cutout in the bottom. Um, you can put like a little LED light and then that allows it to shine through giving it a bit of a glowing effect. And so this also allowed me to see just how loose the kerf might be. Um, and so when gluing this together, uh, it didn't fit super tight, but I didn't make any kerf adjustments, but it wasn't so loose that I couldn't assemble it. So again, um, that 0.08 by 0.1 millimeter cutting area on this eighth inch Baltic birch material um, working out pretty well. Um, if I wanted to really dial it in, I'd probably do a kerf test and uh, get it just snug to where they friction fit. But this is basically held together with just a little CA glue and um, the box joints. So now all of these tests I've been doing with Lightburn, but this does have this offline controller. And in the past, I haven't thought too much of these, but playing around with this one, I'm actually somewhat impressed with the capabilities of the menus in here. You can actually go in and turn on and off some of those safety features such as tilt detection and flame detection, but you can also turn on and off the feature to resume on power failure. Now in my testing of this, and I will show it to you really quick, um, it works well from this offline controller, but I don't believe it's something that's gonna work if you're running it from Lightburn. Now, I'm not 100% sure on that, it's just from my testing, uh, it needed to have it in the, in the 
local controller, it needed to be running it through there. Lightburn does a thing where it kind of streams the G code to the machine while it's running. It doesn't transfer it all over and then start the job. So if that gets interrupted, Lightburn doesn't know necessarily. It recognizes that the laser's gone and it stops, but it, it's, uh, there's no record of where it left off. So um, that feature is most likely just going to be for when using this offline controller. Um, that being said, if someone knows better and wants to correct me, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I'd love to know how that feature might work in other operations as well. So let's take a look at the menu options and some of the functionality. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and turn on the machine. We do not have a computer connected to it, as you can see here. And so the machine is gonna power up and it is going to zero. And then your screen is gonna say zeroing successful. Now you have your front screen here, which gives you two options, either your engrave or your setting. If we go over into setting, this is where you can see um, Basically some of the things you can fine tune. We've got our tilt detection that's on, you can turn that off. We also have our flame detection. Again, we can turn that on or off. Um, you have your fast, standard, and fine mode. Um, so that just um, changes the engraving mode selection and uh, will adjust some internal kind of speed and acceleration things to fine tune things. Now we can also, in here, we can turn on or off our autofocus. We can, enable or disable the resume engraving. So that is our op when it uh, loses power and then touch sound. And then the auxiliary positioning is if you want to turn on or off your red crosshair. Now I like using the laser light to do my framing and such. So I have that turned off. And then there's just a mount which will tell you the firmware and the machine size that this is set up. So we come back out and we are in our engrave settings. And so when we tap on there, it just gives you basically a file menu and so there's some folders in there that come with some of the specs and the software, but then they also have a couple, there's a test file they have in there, but I went ahead and added my Ventari logo. Now, when I tap on this, that's gonna start firing up the machine and it'll probably spin up the fans. Now with this, we of course have some options here. We have frame, move center point, things like that. And then we can also jog the machine around, which is really nice if we need to get to the position of where our material is at. So now let's go ahead and put some material down. I'll put this here. Now what we can do is we can move our laser spot to wherever we want our home to be and we are going to set as bottom left. So that's basically setting your home plate. Now we can hit frame and it will outline the area of whatever it is we're going to engrave. Now if we're done, we can hit close, that'll go back there. We've got autofocus turned on, so we have to hit the play button. So now you'll see the laser is raising up. It's going to hit its top extent, and then it's going to raise back down. And it'll just touch off. And sensing where the material's at. Double check it. It'll know, and then it's going to move back to its start point. We're still saying autofocusing. There we go. And then it will start, go ahead and start the engrave. Now, while it's engraving, you do have a few things. You can pause the job, you can stop the job, but you can also change your power and speed on the fly. Uh, you can't go over 100% power, but if you're noticing it's too thick and you want to try scaling back, you can either go on 1% or 10% increments. Same thing with speed. If you feel it's going too slow or too fast, you can actually bump it up. Now, there is no display on here as to what that speed actually is. You'll just have to figure that out from your file. But now let's go ahead and test the off or the power loss mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove power. So the machine shut down, screen went black. So if we power this back in, plug this back in and it's going to turn on, our lights coming on. This is gonna say zeroing again. Now it says unexpected power failure detected during engraving. Do you want to continue engraving? We're gonna go ahead and hit okay. It says decoding the file, moves back to where it believes it was at and then resumes the file. So as you can see, that could be useful, but um, as far as I understand, it's only while working with this device.
So that is going to wrap it up for this one. We did some testing on both cutting and graving on different thicknesses and detailed. And overall, I think this is a really nice machine. Uh, if you are looking to be able to cut thicker material, but still want some quality in engraving, this is definitely something to consider. Um, but uh, go ahead and take a look at more of the information that's out there. I will have links down below for this laser where you can uh, learn more about it. And if you use that link to purchase it, it does give me a little bit of kickback and tells, shows Acer that uh, I was helpful in you making the decision on your purchase. If you'd like to learn more about lasers or anything in my workshop, I invite you to stick around and check out some of my other videos and uh, hit that like button, leave a comment. And if I earned it, definitely subscribe to my channel as I do try to get out here pretty regularly to look at new machines, play around with new uh, projects and uh, share some tips and tricks with you as well. I will also have links down below to things that I find useful with this and other lasers. So uh, those are affiliate links. Again, they do give me a little bit of a kickback, which do help me continue to do more things out here, buy supplies and uh, different items to have some fun and share some things with you. So um, again, if you use them, I appreciate it, but as always, no pressure. So once again, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for watching this video. And I do hope that you can get out into your workshop and make something too. We'll see you next time.